Hey guys, this is Bao, better known as Modern Rock. Welcome to our second podcast. What's up everyone? My name's Alex. I'm 26 years old. been trading for about six years now. Uh, and today's going to be a really special episode. So today's episode is going to be about how Bao and myself got started trading and how we kind of met each other and kind of where we are today. But you know, before I continue, I kind of want to mention that if you're brand new to trading, if you don't know anything about stocks or the market, uh, Bao and I create a free two-hour mentorship course for the brand new trader. There's no strings attached. There's no funny business. All you have to do is reserve your spot at myinvestingclub.co. So uh, let's get started, Bao. Do you want to kind of talk about yeah. your journey? Uh, well, this is going to be a special edition because I've always wanted to tell the, my story as in how I started and what it takes and the reality behind what it takes. Because a lot of people think that trading, you have to be from the Ivy League, you have to go to Harvard, you have to be this, you have to be that, you have to have a lot of money, and that's further from the truth, man. The best traders I know, they didn't, they didn't grow up rich, they didn't go to college, they, they didn't go to Ivy Leagues. They, what they had in common was they worked their ass off, they were disciplined, and they never gave up. And so that's what we want to talk about today, because Alex and I are very different in terms of our backgrounds, in terms of who we are, our age difference, things like that. But we have something very in common. We are very passionate about what we do. We're very hardworking. And, you know, we care. We care, truly care about ourselves, our families, all that stuff. And so all that has translated to our success. And so by success, it, I'm not talking about financially. I'm talking about just being the person that we are, that we want to be, come. Um, so with that in mind, let me start by telling uh, – Everyone, how I started, okay, Alex? Um, I've been trading for a long time, man, <laughs> like over two decades. People didn't realize that stocks used to trade in fractions, man. Right now, you see a stock trading, let's say, at $2.52. It didn't happen back then. Back then, it was actually, it's weird. I just don't understand. Like, when you think about logic, it should be in decimals like it is now, right? But it was, in, for some strange reason, in fractions, man. IBM was trading at $104.00. Three eighths. What the heck is a three eighths? So we usually have these calculators. I used to have a calculator sitting by my desk, Alex, and I would actually have to start. <laughs> what is three like sixteen? What what the hell is that, right? So you have a bit like well, one hundred and three sixteens by one hundred and and five sixteens. I would just like, what's the spread? And it's, it's so we became very good at math. So back then it was kind of funny, right? I mean, if you think about it logically now, it's like, what the heck? Computers were. Like we're doing that stuff back then, you know what I'm saying? So it seems kind of counterintuitive. Um, but the reason they did that, in my opinion, before, is because when you're doing it in fractions, the spread is so big, dude. Because with decimals, you can get down to one penny, right, Alex? And what is a penny in fractions? It's one one hundredth. And you don't see that. The, the most I've seen is like a, a 64 or 32. But if you're doing $100 stocks, you're doing one fourth, one eighth. And you imagine... You know, like right now, if a stock is trading at, let's say, 25 cents spread, you're like, holy cow, that's a big spread, right? Imagine you're trading in fractions. You're, you're trading by 25 cents. You're trading one, one fourth is 25 cents. And so the market makers were making the spread. These companies, these brokers making the spread. And so they were big bucks back then. And so uh, when it started to become decimalized, people were scared. Because everyone's scared of changes, right? So I, I remember back then when they started talking about decimalization. And I was like, holy cow, how can you trade? How can you trade? I was not an expert trader by back then. I was just gambling at that point. I just started trading. I was just gambling. But they thought that the world would end decimalization. It's like Y2K, things like that. So it's kind of funny where the market has shifted when logically it should have been in decimals to begin with. Who the heck is trading in three eighths? Right? Things like that. So... That's the world that I came from, but even before then, man, I, I want to talk about the reason I want to do this podcast is to, to try to inspire you as to, you know, it, it, you don't need to start, you don't need to have like an Ivy League education. You don't need to have like super rich parents in order to day trade. Um, and day trading is not gambling. So the moment I became successful at day trading is the moment I realized that it is not gambling. If you do it correctly, it is not gambling. So how, when you started trading, Alex, it was already decimals, right? 
Yeah, so when I started trading, uh, it was right when the marijuana stocks were collapsing. So everyone made a shitload of money on the marijuana stocks. I wasn't really involved. And as soon as I started, everything just went straight fucking down. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Because I didn't know that I, as a small time trader, could trade NASDAQ stocks. I thought that I could only trade penny stocks, OTC stocks, because I wasn't a professional, you know? Yeah, man. It's like, dude, I, the marijuana was crazy, man. I made many millions on that, that craze. It was crazy. Um, but anyways, even before that, man, let, let, let me, let's, let us talk about our upbringing, how we grew up. And so people can understand like where we came from. Right. I, I'm actually an immigrant, man. I came, I've, you probably heard this story, uh, many times, but I'm going to tell it again from my point of view. I came to America when I was five years old, didn't speak the language. I was actually a Vietnamese boat person. That was a name technically after the war. So after the Vietnam war, dude, it was very bad. And so it, people were trying to escape Vietnam. Um, and so my family, my mom got into a boat. It was a tiny ass boat. I posted pictures of this on Twitter. People didn't believe me. Um, but we escaped, man. It was three days in the ocean. Uh, no food, no water. Uh, my best recollection of my favorite meal was when we were finally rescued on the boat and the sailor guy, I forgot who rescued us, but it was a, on our way to Thailand. They gave him me crackers, dude. And I still remember this cracker for the rest of my life. Oh man, you found that. <laughs> yeah. So for, so for those that don't know, uh, we do the podcast on audio and we also do it on video on YouTube and the video version, I'm pulling up the picture of Bao from uh, Vietnam. So if you want to check out the podcast on YouTube, it's youtube.com slash my investing club. Yeah. Thanks for finding that, man. I mean, for the longest time, dude, I was very ashamed of this photo growing up because I was like, who, who wants to be an immigrant, dude? I, I, when I, so this photo is actually in Thailand, dude. And this was like taking, taking like not too long ago, but that we actually arrived in Thailand. So, so we got saved because the whole thing was to, to flee Vietnam, to go to Thailand because Thailand, now we are refugees so that we, so my dad was in the war. He was in America already. So he sponsored us over from Thailand. But that picture is very significant, man. I mean, I, for the longest time, I was so ashamed of this photo because I'm like, I just want to be a regular kid. I want to be a regular American. I want to be thought of as like some dark skinned kid who's from Vietnam. And back then, man, it wasn't like this today. This was 1980s. I arrived in like 1980 or something like that. And it, and I lived in Portland, Oregon, man, Portland, Oregon. I was the only Asian in the whole entire class. It was me and one African American named Ray Ray, dude. I still remember <laughs> it to this day. And we, I got bullied every day. They called me Bow Wow. And Bow Wow wasn't cool back then. Before the rapper Bow Wow, little Bow Wow became cool. <laughs> now Bow Wow back then was like a dog. They, they kept barking at me. It was, it was horrible, man. And so this is what the adversity that I grew up with. I didn't speak any English. We were poor. We were on welfare. I mean, we just, you know, trying to fucking survive, dude. People would not believe it the way that I am today. People still don't believe it. But when I look back, I still don't believe it. I, I cannot believe I, I was even alive. A lot of the people that escaped Vietnam never made it, dude. It was like, so this is a very similar story to your dad, Alex. Yeah, like, tell me. yeah so my dad um, lived in Turkey. So he lived in a village uh, in Turkey. And they had a house the size of a closet. I think it was like made out of stone or something, something old school. Uh, he had three brothers and four sisters living under one roof. His father was a blacksmith, you know, that makes like fucking metal shit. And basically they were, uh, they were bullied and hazed all of their life because they were religious, right? So my family's Christian and in Turkey, a lot of people are they're not, they're not into that stuff. So, Every single day after school, they, there used to be kids that threw rocks at uh, my dad and his siblings. And the moment that my grandfather found out about that, he built them all these fucking metal rods. He did his blacksmith shit to build them metal rods so that if anyone ever threw rocks at them again, they would have a way to protect themselves. So after all that shit, you know, my father wanted to kind of have a different life and come to America. He said, it's the land of opportunity. It's where uh, everyone is going. His goal was to go there to make enough money to bring his family uh, to America. So uh, he came here 
in his early 20s. I think he was maybe 21 or 22. Didn't speak the language, only spoke Turkish. Didn't have really a dollar. The way that he came here is he went to Canada. And then from Canada, he came to uh, New York. Um, so he actually, it's kind of crazy because I think about it to myself, man. Like if right now I'm 25 years old and I fucking fly to Russia and I don't know the language and I don't have any money, I have no idea how I would ever survive there. Yet my dad found a way to do it. And it kind of blows my mind. Like the whole story of even you bow, like you coming and not really not knowing anything and being bullied is kind of crazy because shit, man, it's like, it's like, I can't do that stuff today. So I have a very deep level of respect and admiration for anyone that kind of does that stuff these days. But that's the thing. I, I feel sometimes like I am like your dad, Alex, and I'm like you as well. I'm a, you know, I'm like a combination because, you know, I went through the adversity that your dad did, but at the same time, it's like, uh, you went through the same shit that I went through, you know? So it's the same exact bullying, the same thing. Cause people don't understand us, man. They, they look at you, Alex, and they go, Oh, that's a rich kid, but they don't understand that the struggles that your dad went through. You see what I'm saying? They, they just take it for granted. They, they look at me now. It's the same exact thing, dude. They look at me and they go, this is a guy that drives an icon. He doesn't relate. He's an asshole. He's an egomaniac. He is, you know, it, it, it's like, dude, do you not understand that that doesn't mean shit for me? It's, it's, Everybody is, can do this. So my, my whole thing when I grew up, man, was to be able to tell the world that, hey, man, uh, I am not marginalized. The people that are immigrants, the people that are, you know, like the people that have to work their ass off to get where they are, you know, like, dude, it, those are the people that press me the most. And when I grew up, there was really hardly anybody that fucking helped me, man. I, I came to this realization that, society is kind of fucked up in the sense of they only want to help people if it benefits themselves. So like the Paul, I don't want to get the politics, but the politicians always do stuff because they want to get votes. Um, friends want to be friends with someone because they got money or fame or something they want from them. Right. And so it was a very sad feeling growing up to be very lonely, to be able to, uh, I mean, to be, to be like basically shoved aside like trash. Because that's what we were, man. I was an immigrant. My family was an immigrant. We were considered fucking trash, dude. It's like, how do we help society? How do we help America? And so growing up, I, I, I carried so much fucking hate with me, which drove me to my success as well, I can say. But at the same time, I was very angry. I was not happy. I did everything for the wrong reasons. It just so happens that I made it. That's because... I had to, dude. I had to take it. There's no fucking choice. There was no safety net. There was, n if I fail, I'm dead. You see what I'm saying? So, so that was the whole thing. I didn't, not, as an Asian as well, like if you fail, not only do you let yourself down, you let your old family down, your, your dynasty down, your ethnicity down, your, your dog down, whoever the fuck your pet is, you know what I'm saying? It was the most horrible feeling. So, so I'm stuck in this fucking Asian world, but I'm not really Vietnamese, Vietnamese, you know what I'm saying? I'm not really American. So it's kind of like half. So, so I am a, a very represent, very like normal representation of a fucking, the American fucking like melting pot. There's so many people like us just wanting to, you know, just to have our own piece of the American dream, right? So I'll tell you how I, how I did it, guys. I did it by, you know what, man, I, I could fought back. I could do whatever, but I channeled that reason, that, that energy to, to fucking have a purpose. And so you can take your chip on, off your shoulder and either do something negative and fight and do stupid shit like that and hate on other people. I hated people, but I didn't fucking act on it. That's the difference. I channeled it to, to do what I want to do. My whole goal was to say one day, fuck you. I'm going to be your boss. You're going to come and ask me for a fucking job. I'm going to fucking say no. That was my fucking dream as a kid. You know what I'm saying? So, at, when, But when that happened, it didn't really make me fucking happy. So I'll tell you a one, one good story that kind of changed my life as well. So I was, I was maybe in eighth grade or ninth grade, I forget. It was one of those. I used to get beat up every day in, in a PE. Uh, so, you know, like the, the locker room, you take off your shirt, you change for PE. Every time I took off my shirt, I was a little chubby, little Asian kid, whatever. And so the guy next to me was this big, big guy. He was like a, and he would beat me up every fucking day, dude. 
And I was like, I fucking hate it. But I, I had no choice. I was, what, what can I do? So the only thing I do is laugh it off. But I, I hated going to PE, dude. I hate doing this shit. But I sucked it up. And then, and then one day I got sick. And then I went back. And I go, where's that bully? Where's the, and the, the, someone next to me go, dude, you didn't hear yesterday when you were gone sick? He got stabbed. Like, Who the hell stabbed him? This Asian kid next to him. So I wasn't around for him to bully. So he tried to bully the neighbor. But the neighbor was a thug. <laughs> he took a pencil and stabbed him. And so they Holy both got shit. expelled. They both got expelled. And I was like, oh, my God. Now I have fucked. So everything happens for a reason. You know, I, it's just very unfortunate. So, there, so that's when I realized there's two ways to act in life. You know, people piss you off all the time. You can either suck it up like I do and, and fucking channel it. Or can we act negatively like him? So, I mean, I don't, I mean, you can call me a pussy or I'm not, but it's kind of like that helped me, man. What, what good is it for me and my family if I got expelled, right? And I ended up in jail, juvenile hall, where the hell it is, the stabbing, right? So, so that taught me a valuable lesson in life too. It's like, okay, man, ego is one thing, but just, you, you can't be too fucking stupid, man. You know, um, same thing with you, man. I mean, like Starbucks, people don't believe, like, how did you end up in Starbucks? You told me this, <laughs> but I don't know what you want to share with people. Like, yeah, I mean, sure. So uh, let me actually pull up the photo. So this is me when I was working at Starbucks, if you could see the, uh, the screen here. <laughs> it's but, Photoshop, bro. Yeah, me Photoshop, right? <laughs> nice and skinny. Uh, so what ended up happening is, so my dad came to this country in the 80s. Uh, he opened up his own business and he was thriving for a very long time until I think it was early 2007, early 2008. Uh, his business went bankrupt. So all of a sudden, all the hard work that he did and everything that he worked his ass for was almost disappeared instantly because of the whole, you know, 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008 in uh, America. So, you know, I had a choice. I could either just sit there and do nothing or I could try to get a job and try to help my family out. So that's kind of how the whole Starbucks thing started. There was a Starbucks maybe five minutes away from my house. Uh, I applied to get the job there. I learned everything about the whole business and the drinks and everything. And the crazy part was back then, you know, I was making, I think it was like a hundred or $120 a week, uh, after taxes. How old were you in this picture, man? This picture has got to be when I was like 18 or 19. At wow. least. So yeah, I think I was college? still, I think I was end of high school, first year of college or something like that. Very, very early. Um, so I started just working there because I said, you know, that's probably going to be, I, I just wanted a job, man. I just wanted a job to make some money. I had a girlfriend at the time. So basically the way that I split up my money was, you know, gas was really, really expensive back then. So to fill up my tank, it was like $60. So I filled up my tank for $60. You know, I took my girlfriend out to the movies for 40 bucks, maybe had some food for like 30 bucks. And that was it. I had no more money left for the entire week. So I was working my ass off the entire week just to be able to, you know, hang out with this girl, make her happy. And, you know, what ended up happening is uh, she broke up with me and I was really upset. So I, this was kind of like my first real girlfriend at the time. And I really liked her and I was head over heels. This, just being young, I guess. But She broke up with you for the manager? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. She broke up with me. I think she found, she found someone better, I guess. I don't know. Someone more good looking. But... Yeah. But, but that's awesome, man. You, you, see, you, you see the commonalities now. So working at Starbucks, it take, I mean, dude, I, I don't know if I can work at Starbucks now it, because people are screaming at you, right? You're, oh they're God, ordering you around. Have no idea. You have no idea. So there's guys ordering, you know, venti double frappuccino lattes with skim milk and, you know, all this shit that you got to remember. And they, they, they're really, they have no, no patience for you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because the people that drink coffee in the morning, man, they, they give me my damn coffee, man. I can't start my day and stuff. So, and then I, I, I see it, man. It's like it takes a certain personal, a personal personality to like be able to take it. Because I, man, I, I, I work retail. My first job actually was at um, at a great. It was it's called Great America, which is Six Flags amusement park. So I actually worked there for a fucking minimum wage, dude, three dollars and fifty cents. Wow. That's how old I am. My minimum wage back then was $3.50. I remember working for, dude, basically almost a month and got like $300 paycheck. My first paycheck, I remember exactly what I did with it. I bought a CD player 
fucking CD player for almost like $250, $300. That's that expensive right back then. And two CDs. Wow. And I'm like, I worked for an entire fucking month, dude, to buy like two CDs or some shit. And CDs was brand new back then. So I still remember the first CD I bought. It was Erasure. It's fucking funny, dude. Erasure. I don't even know who that is, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that's modern rock kind of shit. That, that's where I got my name. So people always ask me, why you got modern rock? Modern rock is a genre of music. It's like new wave music. It's European kind of, um, kind of pop dance, kind of like the precursor to... Uh, trance i i can say i don't know man. It's, it's, it's basically synthesized music with synthesizers and stuff so that's that's where my name comes from modern rock uh, it's cheesy as hell it's i, I just don't know why it's just kind of carried on for like geez since i was a kid man i, I just gave myself a stupid ass name uh, <laughs> before that was insomniac insomniac might have been a better name <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, I mean, so I was at Starbucks, my girlfriend broke my heart and I said, you know, I have a choice. I could either get upset and just deal with it and, you know, become a hermit and just whatever, or I could find a way to kind of, you know, like you said, Val, like to never deal with that shit again. So I thought the way to deal with it was to just get rich. So I said, I'm going to get rich now. I'm going to make her regret her decision. Uh, I'm going to show her why she lost. And if she ever comes back, when I say no, it's going to be the best moment of my life. So you, when, you see how it does, you see how it happens, man. Some, some bad thing happens in your life and you can take it two ways. You can say, fuck you, fuck you. Or you can channel it the way Alex did. He goes, you know what, man, I'm going to fucking prove to her. But when, when he says prove to her, I think it's more, you're going to prove to yourself, Alex. That, that's, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. And so same thing as me, man. It's like, fuck this shit. I'm going to fucking prove to myself that I am not just some, some garbage trash immigrant because nowadays man this is a big it, it hurts me man but when i see these these immigration wars and stuff it's like people don't understand like man it, i'd rather have a bunch of great hard-working immigrants than a bunch of spoiled entitled americans and to, to me to, to for me it's like man americans do not understand how great they have it you know, they always complain, complain, but dude, we live in the best fucking country. That's why I always advocate other people going to different uh, travel to see third world countries to, to, so that you can appreciate this shit. I appreciate now so fucking much that because I grew up with nothing and I, I, when I visited Vietnam, these, well, the first time I went back to Vietnam, dude, they didn't even have, like, dude, they were taking, it was an outdoor toilet, dude. It was basically a hole in the fucking ground. So I, this was a while back. I went to Vietnam, and this was like Saigon, which is the, 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 the city too, man. And I remember going to a cell phone store to visit someone, and I asked for the bathroom. And then she's like, I don't think you want to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I go, do I want to go to the bathroom? And so she, she takes me out to the back. And this is a cell phone store, dude, right? And this is not like someone's house or anything. This is a fucking business. And in the back was literally a fucking hole on the ground. Wow. And I'm like, I'm cool. I'm just going to pee and leave. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the sort of stuff I was like, man, we don't, I'm not going to take shit for granted anymore. Literally shit. Right? But, um, but th those kind of things like puts me back to reality because like, like Alex says, man, it's like, I'm going to prove to her or rather prove to myself. So a, a story I have, like, so I have, man, I was bullied all, all through school and stuff. I was a very weird kid. Um, I was, I kept to myself. I was an introvert. I think I'm still an introvert. I just happen to socialize because I have to for work, but deep down inside, I kind of like to keep to myself. But, uh, all throughout high school, my goal was to say, fuck you, everybody. I'm going to come back to the, to the 10 year anniversary, like a reunion and say, fuck you, fuck you. Look, look at me, look at me. So when that happened, when my 10 year anniversary reunion, high school reunion came up, I didn't fucking go. I was, Super successful then. I hate you. I hate using that word, but I'm, and I had classmates like classmates like hit me up and say, "Oh man, Val, why didn't you go? I heard you're a baller now." And so, and I, so I my whole intention to go was to, to to flaunt it to them, to say "fuck you." And I'm so when that time came and that and when I actually made something of myself, what is the fucking point? Trying to prove to a bunch of people I do not like. You see what I'm saying? So th this is exactly what you, you, you helped me with it today, Alex, because I, you know, like I, I'm a very sensitive guy. 
Uh, Alex, and, this is why Alex and I are great friends. You know, uh, we're, he's like a brother to me because, dude, he's he's a an awesome, big-hearted guy, just like me. We have so much feelings and emotions, and so, and we wear it on our sleeves, man. It's like we 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 get hurt. I'm a guy, but we're emotional, and so, you know, and so. We, we always like, so Alex likes to remind me about why are you always trying to please the people that don't matter, right? Focus on the people that you care about. And so same thing with the high school reunion. When that time came, I was like, fuck, I came to the realization. This is when I was, so this is, there's many steps from in life that you, you, you remember as in your maturity growth. And that high school reunion was one of them. I wanted to go so badly, drive in my with my fucking Ferrari, saying, fuck you, you think I'm a loser, you bullied me, all this shit, fuck you. But th- when that time came, it was not worth it. I didn't go. I, I felt great by not going because what's the fucking point, dude? It's just like those people don't mean anything to me. And now that they finally talk to me because they, they see that I'm successful or what the hell it is, they want to be my friend. It's like, where the fuck were you when you were bullying me fucking throughout school? Right? They call me all sorts of names, man. It's fucking, you know, it's, it's very different. I think if I grew up today, Alex, I, I'd be even more fucked up. Social media has really fucked up a lot of kids. And so, um, it's tough. You know, I was you have all the cyberbullying the these days, too, bro. You have all the cyberbullying, like having friends comment on your posts and say, like, very hurtful and mean things, having all these internet trolls come after you. Like, it's just, it's tough, man. It's a tough world to live in these days. Especially I know, man. That, that's why I, I decided to do the podcast today. Because I'm like, so you helped me a lot, Alex. You, you basically said, you know, like, man, there's always going to be people that's going to talk shit about you, whatever the hell it is. They don't know you. Who cares? And so, and so it's, it's very hard for me as, as a caring individual to, to, like, overlook that. But I have to. I mean, I'm an old man now, and I'm still worried about what people think about me. You know, it's, it, but... But I think that's the good and the bad thing. It, it keeps me grounded and says, like, dude, I do fucking care about people, man. I'm not sitting here saying fuck you to everybody. I'm genuinely helping people. Anybody that hits me on DM, just like yesterday, man, this, people ask me for money all the fucking time. It's like, they're like hey, Val, can you give me $4,000? Can you fund this? Can you buy me this shit? And, it's like, and so, you know, I was like, so I did the reverse of what I normally do. I actually kind of listened to him. Uh, so I first, I kind of scolded him, but, but, but be, by being positive, like constructive, I was like, you know what, man, uh, instead of asking for money, you, you know, this is your, you had an opportunity to ask me any question you want. When I was growing up, who, I had no mentors to ask. If I wanted help on college, who the fuck should I ask? If I wanted help on my job information or whatever the hell, right? So nowadays, social media, people are using it to show off, to, to troll other people. But, dude, it's a great way to meet people like myself and Alex who's been there who can help you. And so this guy is able to interact with me. And so, so I'm thinking in my head, at least he's fucking reaching out versus attacking me or some shit. And so I, I, I started telling him that and he started to apologize to me. He finally came out and said, you know, he's from Africa. And he only makes $2 a month. And so I, I, no, I did one thing to him. I, you know, man, when I go out, I spend hundreds of dollars on stupid shit like alcohol. I'm, today, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give him 100 bucks, just to fucking like, because like, I want to show to him that someone fucking cares and doesn't want anything in return. If I can save one person a day, my goal is like, just, just be a positive influence on one person a day. You imagine that one person goes out and helps another person and vice versa, right? And so this is the thing that I've been trying to do every day. Every day I'm trying to do one positive act. It's very hard, man. I'm telling you, it's very hard to, to do things without selfish reasons. And so I've been trying to get my, my head around that, right? Like everything that we do, we always want some shit out of it. Um, so is there such a thing as a selfless act? I mean, just because that's the thing. I feel bad about just talking about it. So by talking about it, does it mean that I'm actually selfish, that I'm bragging that I did this? You know what I'm saying? So it's like, but the reason I speak up upon it is I want other people to, to look at life like that. You know what I'm saying? To, to, like Alex today helped me a lot. You know, he, you know, not many guys can tell another guy, like, hey, brother, I love you. you, you know, things like that, right? A lot of guys are like very tough and shit. And so I appreciate that, Alex. And so. <laughs> I love you, bro. What am I going to say? Because like, dude, it's. What I've known or what I've learned about you is you're a very 
caring person. You really actually care about trying to make the world a better place. Like, you know, one of the first times I've met you uh, when we were partying together, what I remember is, you know, rather than tipping the hosts at the club or tipping the bouncers, you went to the bathroom and tipped the bathroom guy a hundred dollars. And you had no reason to do that. You don't get anything out of that, but that just goes to show that you are even trying to help and look out for the little guys that are overlooked. And that's why I think this stuff matters so much to you is because like you said, you're trying to do one good deed a day to make it so that another person does a good deed and then a domino effects to make the world a better place. And you know, some of these people on the internet and on social media are just such hateful, negative people. And the problem is that, you know, we have to be focusing our energy on trying to help the people that want to be helped rather than wasting our time trying to help people that are clearly very brainwashed in their thought process. So, I mean, dude, like I say it all the time and you say it all the time that we're both very emotional people. Uh, I don't, I mean, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing that we're like this, but I mean, it's caused us and led us to where we are today. And again, it's not easy trying to give constructive criticism to someone. It's not easy trying to help someone because at the end of the day, no matter what advice you give someone, no matter what you tell them, unless they want to change, unless they want to improve, they will never do it themselves. It's the same thing with the Starbucks story. I had a choice. I could either sit there and do nothing or I could try to improve and make my life better so that, again, maybe for my own selfish reasons, I could feel better about myself, you know? But yeah, man, that's the thing. It's like, so let's, let's talk about trading now. Yeah. <laughs> we talk- <laughs> <laughs> we're supposed to talk about our stories but you know this is a big component of who we are and in my opinion that a big key ingredient to success regardless of what you do is being humble being able to drop your ego and say you know what man i am vulnerable i am sensitive i am emotional i am i am not a perfect person i i'm willing to learn i'm willing to become better I, i'm not here to fight you i admit i have these flaws and so I, that was my thinking all along when I started learning to trade. And, and so I'm open to, to hearing and helping, uh, to hearing other people helping me. It could be a guy that just started trading can give me one great advice. Just like Alex helped me a lot. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that's how we bounce back to one another. And so I've always had great trading buddies. I had a few. Um, what, what they have in common was, they're exactly the personality that dude. They are, they are not jealous. They're happy for your happiness or success. That's a key thing. That's very hard to find in another human being, man. Because people are, uh, people in our industry are very competitive. If one person is up, they're like, "Oh fuck, I'm smarter than you. I can do better. I'm better looking than you. I can make more money." And so they're not help happy, but they don't understand that. You know, man. It's like. If they, if another person succeeds, does does not mean that it makes you any less. It should motivate you. If you think you are truly smarter than the other person, that other person having success should motivate you to say, you know what, man, if this guy can do it, I can do it 10 times better. And so that's, you know, that's the sort of attitude in my opinion that you should have in life. Don't be hating. Be appreciative that he has paved the way and showed you that even if the dumbass guy can do it, I can do it. And that's always been what I was trying to tell the world. Uh, if you take a look at how I am versus the rest of the traders out in the world, we are very different, man. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not here flashing shit. I'm like, I'm a normal guy. I drink. I don't try to hide shit from people. I tell people how I am. I'm a, I'm a flawed human being, but because of that, you know, it helped me to get through all the negative shit in my life, as well as to show the world like, you know what, man, you don't have to be a fucking perfect person to become successful at anything you fucking do. You know, just be your fucking self. If I can do it, guys, if I can do it, if Alex can do it, you guys can do it too. We are definitely not the model, the model Ivy League, the fucking uh, Goldman Sachs type of guys. You know, in fact, I apply for those jobs and shit. They, they don't accept me. I'm, I didn't go to the right school when I, when I apply for jobs. So let me, th- let me tell you another inspirational story. So I went to UC Davis. I studied engineering. And so for most people, UC Davis is a very good school. I had a bunch of choices I could have gone to. I, I, I turned down Berkeley, actually. 
It was the top engineering school in the fucking country, right? I turned it down. That's because I grew up in the ghetto. We didn't have counseling. Um, we didn't have guidance counselors. You know how I took the fucking SAT, Alex? No, you, what happened? You took the prep courses, right? I yeah, I did. I walked into the fucking class. Like, the exam time, I read the fucking instructions, bro. <laughs> That's crazy, saying, bro. Fuck, fucking do the SAT. I'm reading the directions on the fucking SAT, dude. Wow. And I still did very well. I scored a very good score. I got to I got into Berkeley, but that, that's the thing, man. It's like being privileged, man. It it it, it it's a great start, but being un, not privileged it doesn't mean it's a it's an ending to your life. And I want to tell you something, man. If I if I was counseled to go to Berkeley, I would not be here with you. I'd be a fucking normal, boring ass engineer hating my fucking job, regardless how much money I made. So when I got out of school, I applied for jobs and they always asked this, what other school did you apply to? And I told them Berkeley and then, and then uh, I got, I didn't want to go. So no one believed me. So first off, I was already fucking trolled, dude. <laughs> the moment I graduated college, I was already trolled. They didn't think, they're thinking I was a paper fucking admissions guy, right? <laughs> paper college guy, right? Um, but so I never got those jobs I really wanted. You know, I, I, I consider myself highly intelligent, highly skilled for that job. But the fact that they didn't believe me and I was not credible, even though it's a fucking absolute truth, they didn't hire me. And so I only got hired by one company and um, it was, you know, and that's what led me to look and reinvent myself. So I'll tell you the secret of life. It's called finding your niche, guys. If I had a job as an engineer, I would never fucking work my butt off to excel. I would be very comfortable making my comfortable, nice salary as an engineer. Uh, I would never look to do and, and maximize my other talents. So I call it finding your niche. You know what my niche was? I was a good engineer, but I wasn't the best engineer. I like to party, I like to go out, I didn't like to study. Where the real core engineer guys are, dude, they're at home on Saturday nights reading a fucking coding book, a computer book. You know what I'm saying? They're living and breathing that. That's why they're successful. I could do all that. And so I had to find my niche. You know what? I looked at myself. I go, what are you good at, Val? So I found, so I'll give you an example. So what I did was this. I said, you know what, man? I'm very good at articulating complex things to a normal human being. And so I went into sales engineering. And so now instead of coding and making the product, I was selling the product. And I make twice as much, three times as much doing that as I did as an engineer. It's, it's fucking remarkable because I, when I found my niche, I was like, who the fuck can articulate things well? Uh, be personable to talk to executives who have buying decisions. It's not the engineers who are nerdy and stuff. And so I was competing with the wrong, in the wrong things. So when in life, if, if you do not like the test questions, this is what I like to tell people, right? If you do not like the test questions, go and write your own fucking test. So I wrote my own fucking test. I went out and I, I forged my niche to find exactly what I wanted to do. So I was a huge, so I, I was very surprised. I was like, dude, I worked like a third of the time as much as I did as an engineer. I've I made fucking two, three times as much as I made. And so you, you just have to find what, what your niche is. You know what I'm saying? And so I was not very successful as an engineer because I hated doing that engineering shit. I was very good. I did the bare minimum. And so that's the thing. When I, so, so if I had gone to Berkeley, I would have never found my niche because I would be too comfortable. And then when I found my niche, I, was, I realized that there was a glass ceiling in corporate world. I, did, I can only do so much. I, I was passed over for a lot of promotions. So one thing that registered to me, Alex, this is crazy, man. They, in sales, it's all about talking and how you look and presentation, right? They, uh, my boss, before he, he did not promote me, he basically told me, uh, why don't you change your name? People can't fucking pronounce your name. I'm like, motherfucker. You know, I told him, I was like, I'm not going to change my name. People better learn to pronounce my name correctly. And so with that attitude, I'm like, dude, I'm not going to fucking sit down and conform to what people think. But I'm not going to be fighting people, but at the same time, you know, there, there's a limit. If that conformed, I would still be their fucking monkey, dude. 
And so I felt I reached a glass ceiling because of racism. People don't believe it, man. There's fucking huge racism out there. Um, a guy, when, when I'm on the phone with a customer, they think I'm a white guy. And then when they meet me, they're like, holy shit, you're fucking Asian. Right? I don't sound like an Asian. What's an Asian supposed to sound like? They supposed to sound like this or what I'm saying. Like, but it's like fucked up shit. And so, so that's, why I, that's when I moved to New York. I was living in New York and working as a sales engineer. And everyone was doing day trading. I just happened to love it, dude. I, in the beginning, I was gambling. I thought it was a gamble. I made a lot of money in, in my job. So I would take that money and just fucking, fucking start trading stocks. <laughs> and when you start trading, you think every, you think you have a fucking system. So I had, I was gambling on earnings. And I was like, hmm, I'm going to analyze the earnings and, and, and fucking guess. So my very first trade, my very first trade, I made 33% in Silicon Graphics. Uh, it, it fucking went, the stock went up. I was like, fuck, this is easy, dude. I got a fucking system. So I was like, fuck, I'm going to, so I'm like, if I make 33% every fucking trade, I'm going to be fucking a billionaire soon. <laughs> so I, all I did was research this shit. I thought I had the fucking game because I, I started making money doing the earnings. And next, you know, dude, I picked the wrong shit. It started going down and I lost all my fucking money, obviously, right? At the end, you always lose all your money. But that's when I realized that, you know what, man, I love this trading thing. And I became very good at it because I was very passionate about it. So I always tell people, make passion your paycheck. I never knew I was going to be like how I am today in trading. I would never imagine I'd be fucking sitting here with you 20 years later, helping other people, being successful, whatever the hell it is, right? I just wanted to do it because I loved it. I, I, I did not like my job. But you know what, man? There's a leveling up. In, in life, you, just because you, I love playing football too, doesn't mean I'm fucking quitting my job and become a, a wide receiver for the Cowboys. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I wanted to do when I was seventh grade, man. I wrote essays on how I wanted to be the wide receiver for a fucking Cowboy. I didn't fucking realize that they're not going to take me a four foot ten Asian guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, man, because I, I had kind of like a similar experience with my first trade. So I was actually, when I started trading uh, after Starbucks, I lost a bunch of money going long because. Uh, what I was taught was that you have to just buy the breakout. Anytime the stock breaks out is when you got to buy it and that's the trade. And every time that I did that, the stock did the reverse. It went straight down every single time. So uh, it wasn't until I discovered what shorting was, which was you make money when the stock goes down, that my trading kind of changed. So the first short trade that I ever took was on a stock called VGGL. I shorted 2,000 shares at $4 and it was like 30 seconds later, the stock tanked 50 cents. I made a thousand dollars and I was like, that's it. I'm going to be rich. I found it. I found the secret. And then slowly, like you said, Val, the trades after that were losers because you have no process. You have no idea what you're doing. You're just shorting shit or buying shit because it's up or down. And that's not the right way to do it. So it was only until again, like you mentioned that we have to refine our process and understand that we should only be trading with an edge. And that's kind of what changes our trading around, you know? Hey, Alex, do you have that spreadsheet, uh, the calendar that I, I, I made back in the day, 2009? Yeah, let me try to find it. Give me one second. In the meantime, you want to talk about it? So, yeah, so, so flash forward to trading. I, you know, man, people make a lot of money. People lose a lot of money. What I realized is this, man. It's not how much fucking money you make in one day. It's how much you can consistently make it over time. Uh, and a good example is this. So one of my old friends, this, he took me to the next level of trading. Um, he didn't realize this, right? So I was just making my $300 a day, bro. I was making consistently every fucking day, $300, $500, $300. And then, um, and then this guy, he's a dumb guy. <laughs> I mean, I don't hate to say he's dumb, but he's not very intelligent. He'd be springing up and down 25,000, 10,000. And it's like, holy fuck. This, this guy, um, but he'll be losing that the next day. He'll be fucking losing that the next day, right? But then I'm just, so remember when I said you can either look at someone and hate them or admire them to motivate you. So that guy motivated me. I didn't hate him. I was like, fuck, if this guy can do it, I can do it too. Because I was a whip, dude. I was training tiny size. Um, so I started increasing my size. And then you knew I was making consistently thousands of dollars a day. But, but, then, but then he always looked down upon me. He's like, oh, you're trading penny stocks. You're, you know, and so he never took me, you know, seriously. And then later on, he blew up. Obviously, he blows up. He's now driving an Uber taxi. Uh, he was, he was 
so when remember when I talked to you, Alice, you were swinging up and down like him. I saw that. I was like, dude, I don't want you to be like that. It's like you want to scale over time. You you don't you know as a, you don't jump in making twenty thirty thousand a day. You're gonna fucking eventually gonna kill yourself and stress or whatever else. And so he he fucking he just fucked up. It's like when you're trading that size, you just can't handle it. You know what I'm saying? So um, I don't want to get too much of that story because uh, Alex knows that story too, and uh, uh, one of his partners, my friends and stuff. But um, so here's I think I found the screenshot. Now this is two thousand nine. Let me see. Two thousand nine. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. I've never shown anybody this. Count the number of red days, Alex. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine red days in all of uh, 2019. 2009? Oh, two, 2009. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. There's some more over here. Uh, let me see. Let's count them over here. I got one. <laughs> Okay, see, one, two, three. How many of that? Let me see. I got one in January, two in February, three in March, nothing in April, nothing in May, nothing in June. July was one. August was three. September, nothing. October, nothing. De uh, November, nothing. December, nothing. December, I fucking pissed off because I took off a vacation. <laughs> but, but take a look at the, the lost days. How big were the lost days? Yeah, so... <laughs> so January losing day was $2,000, but you still made 27,000 on the week. Uh, February <laughs> uh, that month, you made 103,000. Uh, February, you lost 5,000, but you made 27,000 in that week. Um, March, Dude, that scratch, I don't count the scratch. That's the scratch. Yeah, that's, that's, that's nothing. I don't even, I don't even look at that. But look, if you look at consistency, January, 103,000. February 52,000, March 72,000, April 54,000, May 67,000, June 576,000, July 232,000. It just goes on and on and on, you know? So this was not my biggest financial year by far, but it was my most consistent year. And so that's what I was the most proud of. And so there is a level of size that you can go up and any more and you're not comfortable you're gonna get dinged and so i mean i did well if you take a look at this it's like i call it like you know fishing there there'll be days where i just make thousand bucks five hundred dollars and then there's other days i'm making like hundreds of thousands of dollars in a day so you just have to you just have to fucking fish and, and work your process so that year i ended up let me see fuck, i don't want i hate talking about this shit but I guess I did okay. That year was around 2.1 million, it looks like. And I missed that. So let me see. Let's take a look at 2010. So 2010. Look how many fucking rings I got, bro. So 2009, you know what happened? 2009, I did not even size up, man. To be honest, I didn't really size up. I kind of pushed it, but I didn't fucking over push it. 2010, this is the, this is the problem. So 2000, after 2009, I'm like, fuck, I only had like 10 losses, right? 10 fucking lost days or something ridiculous, nine or 10 entire fucking year. I'm like, why am I a pussy? Imagine I fucking double my size. I'd be fucking killing. I'd be making 5 million bucks, right? And so 2010, I kind of pushed it and look how many red days I got. It just fucking like, dude, you, you see the total fucking different. I'm still up, but the losses are just like, like staggering more. I mean, it's still okay, but it's, it's, it's nowhere where I should have been. So this was an example of over pushing it. You know what I'm saying? One year I was very consistent. No stress, Alex. Remember we talked about no stress. This year was more stressful. I made money because I kept on pressuring myself. And so sizing up and pressuring yourself may not always lead to a bigger payout. Yep, it's true. It's true. And that's kind of what I was struggling with. You know, I became a consistently profitable trader. I started making, I started with, you know, $50 a day, then it went to $100 a day, then it went to 200, then 500, then 1,000. And then it got to the point where I said, I have to stop being a pussy and it's time to size up. And what ended up happening is, you know, I'll be making 30,000 on Monday, losing 50,000 on Tuesday, making 80,000 on Wednesday. And it was just so, so, so stressful that I kind of found myself losing touch with reality. I found myself getting more and more upset and more and more depressed. And it was only until I slowed down my trading that I kind of started to find a little bit more happiness in my life and found 
actually more money trading less size. So, so those calendar years, no one even knew who the fuck I was guys. I was doing this for a long time. Yeah. Uh, people knew me because of the Fannie Mae, but the Fannie Mae trade didn't come until like 2013. That was all the way back to 2009. So you see the leveling up process. People will go, oh my God, you did so well. But they don't realize that, dude, I was doing, I was building up for that one fucking trade. And I always call it like this. Um, luck is when opportunity meets preparation, right? I prepared for that one fucking day. Now, I'm never showing anybody this. I held this. I don't want, I don't want this to de define me because this is just like, just, People think, oh, fuck, you got lucky, what the fuck? But, but, but I wanted to show you that 2009 because this was four years after that 2009. And people didn't see the five years before 2009 that I was building myself from making $300,000 a year trading to $500,000 to a million. You see what I'm saying? It's a slow, consecutive process that leads up to all this thing. So it leads up to that one. So we go back to that, um, the p &L, Alex. What I like the most about this is not the money which I like the money too, obviously. But so I was trading many accounts. So this has happened to be four accounts. But if you take a look at that, so go down to the third account, X U I I. I was fucking making, I was trading millions of dollars of stock, making million, $1.4 million and still managing a $400 fucking position. <laughs> it's funny because some things never change. So I like to point this out because you know, this is what it is, man. It's, it's kind of like, this is my mentality. It was, I was never in it to make the money. To be honest, man, I didn't even see the fucking P and L. Um, I was trade. So I, I, we always say trade your process, right? And so keep to your process. So the moment I looked at P and L, I just shit myself. That's when I started to say fucking exit, exit, exit. <laughs> so, so the point of this is like, dude, I did, I kept with my process. I didn't know I was going to fucking make this. Who knows anything? Who knew you're going to make this? But I kept my process. Look at the other stocks I was trading. Dude. $79 on NORX. $290 on that. Why the fuck am I still managing these positions? It's because it's my process. You see what I'm saying? I'm just doing the robotic process. And so if you deviate from your process, when well, you screw up. And so this is part of my process. If I, if I just didn't do my process. I don't think I would have been this successful. Uh, even $500 to me is a lot of money guys, because I don't want to take, because if, if I take $500 for granted, what's going to stop me from fucking up everything else. So I've got to maintain form throughout the whole thing. And so that, that was always, always been my thing, man. It's a process. So I want to show everybody this, uh, the path that I never saw anybody this, man. People think that, oh, Bao's an asshole, Bao's lucky, whatever. But people don't understand. This is, I showed you 2009. This is 2013. You know, you didn't see five years before that. You didn't see after. You didn't see any of that stuff. But that point is, this is decades building up to this fucking level. And when you make it, I, I always have this quote, you only need to get rich once, guys. I fucking made it. I put it away. Real estate. I moved it away. I don't fucking need to be trading these sizes anymore. Market conditions change. I was a young kid. I had no fear because I was young. If if I didn't make it, I had time to fucking go. And I'm older now. I have family support. I have you know responsibility. I'm not. I don't need to be fucking stressing all like this. And so this. So this is why I wanted to teach people. And so I didn't. We didn't launch MIC until a year ago. And you know, it's all the way back 2009. I could have started a service, dude. 10 years ago, I could have started a service. I was, you know, I was, but I didn't want to because I didn't think that I was even ready. I had the technical skills, but I may, I didn't have the life skills. I didn't know how to teach. I didn't know how to do this. So throughout the 10 years, I finally learned how to teach. I mentored a bunch of people that became multimillionaires. Um, one of the guys that made 8 million bucks and then fucking retired. Uh, when I made I want that Fetty May trade. He made him over a million dollars. He was my biggest competitor that day. He took most of my fucking fills because I taught him and he was basically training the exact entries and exits as I am. That's how, that's how in sync we were. The same thing with me and you, Alex. Yeah. And it's crazy because if you think about the way life works is I actually had dinner with that guy last night, you know? <laughs> so who would have ever thought that when you were trading with this guy years and years ago that, you know, the two people that you traded with now are just hanging out and grabbing dinner together. So Everything happens for a reason. It's kind of like a full circle type of thing. And it's just, if you think about it, it's pretty fucking crazy, right? 
Dude, everything happens for a fucking reason, man. We, it's like life comes in full circle. I'm so glad that I've, I met you, Alex. Seriously, I, I, it's, I believe in fate, man. This is fucking fate, bro. Remember we found all these old tweets that we were tweeting back at each other and stuff? So. Yeah, man, it's crazy. It's crazy how, and even time flies, bro. We've known each other for so long now that it's just like, but we're like family now. It's more than just friends, you know? Uh, at two, I was like, dude, man, I, I, who knew we were going to start this? I'm like, fuck, dude. I, I didn't start this thing 10 years ago. Why would I ever start this now? And so we always tell people, man, which is the truth. It's like you have, if anything in life, you, it's timing. You have, trading is about timing. A relationship is about timing. The relationship I had with Alex to form MIC is all timing. I, we have to be in the right place. I have to be in the right mental capacity to want to help people. Because like, man, I made enough money where I could just fucking sell into the sunset just like David. He moved to the Turks and Caicos and just fucking disappeared. Took his eight million bucks and get the fuck out, right? Um, I don't want to tell people how much I made in my career, but so you imagine if my fucking pupil made about eight million dollars trading with me in like the four years, whatever the hell he did, you know, you can imagine. But and so like I could have fucking disappeared. And so like why would I fucking sit around answering people's fucking emails, um, helping people unless I really wanted to do it? So it's all timing. You see what I'm saying, man? Now I want to pass my wisdom to the world. I want to help people because, man, when I die, man, what the fuck am I going to be remembered for? I'm not going to be, I don't want to be remembered for any of this shit. I want to be remembered for helping people to changing people's lives. I don't give a fuck about my own life. I'm dead already. But there's going to be generations that can be benefited from our help. And, you know, they may not become the best traders in the world. Not everybody is destined to become the best trader. But the information that they get is going to help them in any career that they fucking want. The hard work, the discipline, uh, being, being able to uh, be surrounded by positive people with like-minded goals. And that's the whole thing. MIC is a great fucking place for people to come in and have positivity. Check out After Hours, man. Pull up the After Hours, Alex. Let me see. Yeah, give me a sec. All right, here's a picture of you in Philly. <laughs> <laughs> See, people just hanging out and chilling. It's like, dude, we work hard. We, we, we build lasting relationships. And that's, that's the whole thing we wanted. We wanted people. This guy flew in Pima. He flew in all the way from Australia, man. And he brought us a boomerang. I believe in karma. You know, boomerang is like what goes around comes around. What you, what you give, you get back, right? And so this is, this is, to me, in my opinion, man, this is my kind of legacy with you to help change lives. And we have changed a lot of lives. Uh, pull up that tweet that, um, uh, go, go to my Twitter and pull up the tweet I, I had with Tom Diesel. This is a remarkable story, dude. I want people to see this. This is so remarkable. So you want to talk about how you met Tom first <laughs> while I pull this up? Yep. So Tom, he joined MIC right when it kind of entered and he, he basically was a Vietnamese guy living in Europe. And you know, we, we, we kind of like, uh, he was a very humble guy and he's like, Bal, I'm going to work my butt off. And, and he goes, man, I've always had a discipline problem. And so we worked together to solve that. And he, dude, he drove a fucking Uber just so that he had money to trade. He worked another job. He drove an Uber while working another job. Read, read some of this, man. Read, read some of this out loud, Alex. For two yeah. city. So, so Tom, the guys, just, start with the guys on top guys. Yeah. Just so Tom said, uh, guys, I just wanted to share the good news. I'll be moving to a new home at the end of this month. Sorry. I haven't been around to help much, but you know how stressful this can all be. I just wanted to say that without MIC, it would have never been possible for me to reach this goal. It's crazy how things have turned around in just one year. I'm glad to be part of this family. MIC changed my life and I'm sure we'll do the same for many people in here. Love you guys as well. And Tom was saying that he was driving Uber at night so that he would be able to we, we read this out loud right here, man. He goes, yeah. So he said, man, to think back, it made me cry. I don't even know how I did it. I was driving Uber at night because that time no one would drive and it gives you better rates. I was driving from midnight till 4 a.m. Then slept in the morning to trade in the afternoon. You know, it's, 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 bro, it's like, even reading this shit right now makes me feel, it makes me feel like so humbled that Tom is exactly the type of guy that deserves to have all of his success because he actually put in the work for it. 
Dude, he he was down. I remember, man, he was down to his last seven hundred dollars, dude. And he wanted to quit. He goes, Bow, I can't do it anymore. My family, I can't support my family, all that. So don't tell anybody this. So what I did was I gave him a free membership to MIC. <laughs> and I was like, dude, man, don't worry about it. Don't tell me. Now don't ask me for free memberships, okay? <laughs> You know, I have, this, that's the type of guy I am, meaning like, man, I have faith in someone because everybody just needs someone to say, I believe in you. And I truly believe them because you know what, man, he worked his butt off. How many people would drive an Uber at night to trade? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, that is the work ethic. And he's honest, man. He's fucking putting himself out there. He was down to his last $700, dude. And then he started making $25 a trade over and over, $50, and started slowly building his bankroll. And now he fucking moved into a new place. He's make, I don't want to fucking talk about how much he makes. That's his own thing. But I guess he's like, he went from 700 bucks to over 100 a year. I mean, holy fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but shit. He was um, saying that the average salary where he's from is $1,500 a month. So he's making almost 10 times that. So, I mean, he might, the, the point is this, man. The point is not the dollar amount. is the fact that this guy is able to do this, and you can too. The only difference is he actually executes, and he, he acts upon what he wants. A lot of us just sit around and talk. I want this. I wish this, but we don't make it happen. So just, just like me, man, the reason I, – I am, I am guilty, Alex. I'm like, fuck, uh, today I didn't work. I had some stuff that I had to handle. And then I was like, I, I always put shit to tomorrow. Like, oh, I'm going to do this podcast tomorrow. And so, so today I was like, I'm I like, fuck, man, fuck this shit. I'm going to fucking do this podcast today. Why, why put off until tomorrow when you can do today? So I'm starting because I, Alex is the h- hardest working guy, man. I was like, I cannot believe how hard you work, Alex. I, I, you work so hard. And, and you inspire me, man. I was like, I'm going to get on my lazy ass and come here and do some work. <laughs> Answer emails, PM, do the podcast, whatever it is. You know, um, I was like you, Alex. I worked my ass off when I was a kid. And over time, it's tiring, man. To be honest, I was very tired. I'm very glad I met you. And it's like, I, I hope you don't break down <laughs> my age, but, but as you can see now, it takes a toll, man, right? It takes an army. It takes a lot of friends and support system to do all this. People think all this shit is easy. It's not fucking easy. It's like, fuck, I've, I've, we never worked as much as we did now. <laughs> I mean, for the past year, we worked our butt off. It was just us and like Tosh, right? It's just fucking, and a bunch of handful of guys. And I thank all the moderators now that, that are helping us. These guys are wonderful people, man. I mean, um, I, a lot of these people, I have no idea before MIC, but they were just wonderful people. That's like, you know, they, they don't need to be a fucking multi-million dollar trader to be a moderator. That's not my intention. My intention is to pick the right people with good attitude to inspire people, to help people. They are now learning. It doesn't matter. People are becoming awesome fucking traders, man. I think they're better traders than I am now. And I'm glad. I'm fine with that. I want the moderators and you guys to trade better than I do. You know what I'm saying? Because you, I mean, if, if, if I can coach you to trade well, fuck, dude, I can do this. We can do this for the masses. That's my whole point. My whole point is to help other people. I'm not here just to fucking help myself. And... And I, you know, that's why I think it hurts me a lot when I hear these negative things. Because we honestly really want to fucking help people. And, and, and we put our heart and soul into this. And it's just fucking sad that, you know, some people are trying to tear us down and stuff. So, but you're right, man. We have to just kind of like forget it. Uh, this is one thing I'm learning. That that's, that's my negative side. I, I get into these depression modes. That's how I was been when I was a kid, right? So some people have their positive side and negative side. When I work, I'm on, man. It's just getting to the point where I'm actually focused on work. That's the hardest thing for me right now because I really don't need to do this shit. <laughs> to be honest, I have so much other shit going on. I don't need to do this shit. And so I have to find the passion and the reason to do this. And so when I read stories like Tom, Tom's story, it fucking motivates the fuck out of me. It's like, damn, dude, there are people out there that are just wishing for the opportunity to learn to do this and we are you know I, i'm i'm not taking credit for this shit this is all this is all him man 
He's fucking phenomenal. We give him straight up. And he is now helping other members to do this. And that's what I love. That was basically our conversation to Tom. My, my conversation with Tom went back there. I was like, you know what? Pay it for it. Pay it for it. I don't, what do I want from Tom? You know, he, he has $700. He's, uh, he has free membership. He's just a wonderful fucking guy, man. Seriously. I just fucking want people to know that. It's like there are good people out there that deserves fucking uh, an opportunity. That's all every immigrant wants in the world, guys, is an opportunity. And like you said, Val, all it takes is one guy to say that I believe in you, and that was what you did for him, and that changed his life. And you changed my life, Alex. You know, you, you're like, Val, I believe in you. Let's start something different. And that's how MSC was started, man. Yeah. So I thank you, man. You believed in me. I was fucking seriously bad that time. I didn't fucking work. I didn't need to work. I would film work once a week whenever I wanted to fucking work. You know, I didn't need the fucking money. I didn't fucking like, dude, I was basically killing myself, seriously, because I was so, I had no purpose, guys. Alex knows this. It's like, dude, everybody needs a purpose. It's not financial, man. It, you don't need to be fucking poor to, to be sad. I was very well off. I was top of my world. My, my, one of my saddest work moments was the day I made all that fucking money in Femi in one day. And then I woke up the next day. I thought it would be, I would be fucking cured of all my depression. I would be fucking happy, but I was so miserable. That actually hurt me when people found out because now my friends never started. My friends didn't pay for shit after that. They go, oh, but I was fucking rich. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, I never got birthday gifts. Uh, no one set up birthday dinners for me because they're like, fuck, take Val. What the fuck does he need? What can he get Val? I never got any fun. I sent everybody Christmas gifts. All those pigs I sent, all those lucky charms you see that I sent, you know what I'm saying? I don't fucking get shit from anybody. Because they always look like me, like, oh, follow me, shit. But I just wanted fucking like, dude, you know, the best gift you give is not a financial, it's a, a thoughtful, caring gift. Like, you think about them, right? And so the pig I sent to you, whatever, it was a cheap-ass gift. I have it right here, bro. Yeah. <laughs> it's on my desk. Always on my desk for good luck. <laughs> the funny thing is I had the pig, I threw them all out because I thought the pig gave me bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> So I threw my pigs out. So the, I guess the pig I give is good, but I shouldn't keep it for myself. So it's good. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's crazy because as like, like we started the, at the beginning of the podcast, we kind of talked about uh, how we got started, like our adversity, what we did to kind of that one moment in our life. We had a fork in the road, right? Uh, that's the one thing that all of us have in common. We had a choice. We could either continue to be depressed or we could do something about it. Tom had the same choice. He could either spend that last 700 he had, or he could try to be proactive and change his life. So whenever you're at that crossroads in your life, because it's going to happen eventually, know that the easy way of just giving up is the wrong way. If you put in the work and you actually want to improve your life, there are so many resources out there that could help you improve your life. Yep. How long is this podcast already? That's it, bro. It's been an hour and 10 minutes. So let's, let's okay, wrap it perfect. up. I don't want to keep, uh, we'll save the rest for the next time. Um, yep. Sounds <laughs> I, good. I, I hope everybody really enjoyed that story. It was not really, um, a blueprint on how you should live your life, but I guess you, now you understand Alex and I a little more. And so I, I'm, you know, hopefully you didn't get bored and trying to figure out who we are, but you know, that, that's our story. You know, uh, there's uh, more interviews online. You can find of me and Alex. Uh, chat with traders has it. Uh, I don't want to repeat all the stuff that's in chat with traders, but check it out, man. Chat with traders episode hundred is mine. Um, I'm 104, I think 104. So perfect. You know, if you guys want to know more, well, the, the, the bottom line is this, I'm going to leave you guys with one thing. You can do it. Don't think that you cannot. I, we all came from huge adversity. I was not even supposed to be alive. I was on a boat. We were raided by pirates. I thought I was going to die as a kid. But here I am, man. We went through adversity. So success is what they, you know, they have this quote. I hate these quotes, but it's true, man. It's like it, life is not a linear line. You have your ups and downs. It's how you bounce back from your failures, man. It's not a failure. It's a temporary uh, bump on the road, right, to your destination. So don't ever fucking uh, lose focus of the goal. And always – Think positive. So I, my whole life, I was like, 
you know, you can either think of life as half empty or half full. I was always very blessed, man. Even even when I had nothing, I was very blessed because I'm alive. But a lot of kids over in Vietnam are not alive. So, so my advice to you guys is, you know what, man? Fuck, fuck everybody, man. Do you be positive? Fucking work your ass off, and you can fucking do it. Love it. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, guys.